the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by Him. Apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. This is Apologetics Profile, a podcast ministry of Watchman Fellowship Incorporated, equipping you to navigate the darkness of this world with the light of the gospel of Christ Jesus our Lord. Here is your host, staff apologist, Daniel Ray. Well, welcome to this special edition of Apologetics Profile. I'm staff apologist, Daniel Ray, here with my co-apologist, senior apologist, Brady Blevins of Watchman Fellowship. And today, Brady and I are going to be discussing tarot cards. So maybe you know somebody that uh, does tarot cards, or maybe you've had a tarot card experience. I know before I was a Christian, I had a tarot card reading. And uh, so and that, was, that was almost 30 years ago. Um, I don't do tarot cards now, but uh, Brady is going to enlighten us in part one and part two about tarot cards. What are they? Where did they come from? What are their history? What does it mean? What's going on in such experiences? So uh, Brady, welcome. It's always good to be chatting with you on Apologetics Profile. How are you today? I am doing fabulous. Always good to talk with you. I, I just can't help as you were doing the intro to think. Um, it, it's in the cards today that we should talk about tarot cards, but I don't know. That's, that's, uh, a, see, that's, that's like what happens. Hap, that's like saying Happy Halloween in our occult <laughs> episode. We, uh, yeah, that don't is. Go there. Uh, of course, that could also be the fact that, you know, I've, I've been a father now for nearly two decades, so um, mm. the goofiness just uh, oozes through. So yeah, Dad jokes is uh, part of the territory. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, but do, we'll let that dad joke slide. Let's get into tarot cards. We have a lot to cover in a short amount of time. Um, just just for some context, uh, you and I know that in the Arlington area near our office, there's a palm reader, tarot mm-hmm. card reader, and there's a whole like magic shop of tarot card stuff and yeah. mysticism and new age things. And you actually have a, a somewhat of a working relationship with the gentleman who... Uh, whose shop sells tarot cards, or at least you go yeah. to him for information on New yeah. Age and the Occult. Uh, and yeah. so um, just just to kind of a background, we're, we're kind of in this. We're not just armchair armchair speculating about what tarot cards are. You've done research. We're, we're going to be promoting a, uh, we're going out putting out a four-page profile soon that you have yeah. written uh, and have extensively researched about tarot cards. So you're the man. Uh, <laughs> let's get into this. What are tarot cards? Brady Blevins. Ah, uh, tarot cards. They have a very fascinating history, uh, mostly because it's it's. In in fact, I think my very first line in my profile is that it's shrouded in mystery and debate, and that's really the best way to say it. Because you're going to talk to some people, and they're going to say, "Man, this has been around for thousands of years." Uh, you know, this is, uh, I mean, uh, basically as old as time itself might near. And then there's going to be others that say, no, 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 this is a relatively new invention. And so one of the things that is I really begin to dig deep and to discover uh, really what is tarot cards, what are tarot cards all about? I, I noticed that while we really can't mark the actual beginning of tarot cards from maybe a larger perspective, or how this stuff has been used in the past, but what we can mark is kind of a modern day uh, idea, a modern day look at at the um, invention, I guess you could say, of of these cards, and it actually is only a couple of hundred years old. But as you look into the 15th century, this is really the the genesis of the uh, of the tarot cards, but not the way that we think of them. So. The the use of cards in games was pretty popular. In fact, it was um, it was kind of a, a, a pastime, if you will, of some of the elite in Italy to make and design cards and then create games. And so there was one particular game that came out called uh, Tarocci. And, and this was this was not based on or purposed for divination or or gaining any kind of knowledge or understanding it was just a card game and it was based on that uh on the cards that this one particular family 
uh, put out that came into what our modern day tarot cards are. And so uh, that is, um, th that's more or less the, the dating of it. Now, as we look at the, I guess, the genesis of these cards, it comes to really a, a fellow by the name of Duke uh, Filippo Maria Visconti. And what he did is he designed some playing cards. Now, again, this is not for the purpose of divination. There's no kind of occultic, you know, um, ties into it whatsoever. Nothing of that nature. And he just inventing a card game. And so he had these cards made in the image of his family members, which was pretty common. And uh, you say, well, how do you know that? Well, the reports are of the likeness of the people in the cards and of course the fact that they all had blonde hair and everybody in his family had blonde hair it points out to the fact that uh that that's what these cards were all about so there were no uh, intentions of this being anything other than just kind of a, a fun card game i mean you almost kind of think of it in a sense as just kind of a novelty type item and so um that's that's the genesis of it. Now, now this Tarochi game started out as a 78-card game. It was later reduced to 62, but, uh, but that's where we start to see some similarities between the Italian game and the tarot cards of today. That's fascinating. So it's kind of like um, something of a modern analogy. It would be like if our uh, Monopoly... Some two thousand, two, you know, a couple hundred years from now, it turns into some kind of a cult game where you channel cash, <laughs> where you know Monopoly money is meaningless except for the game. But this just seems to be like something that Dad made, and hey, let's have a fun mm -hmm. card game with the families, uh, kind of like uh, drawing your family's faces on a Wii video game. You ever yeah, that? Mm -hmm. yeah, same thing, same. Thing. So that very innocent beginnings uh, of this. It doesn't sound uh, too terribly bad, but uh, now. It is associated with what with what we would call Brady occultic practices. Yes. We've had occult, uh, mm -hmm. I should say, and uh, we've we've discussed the occult in um, when we talked about the Ouija board mm -hmm. and uh, other other podcasts and, and profiles. So, um, how did this go from innocent board game that uh, that Dad created, you know, the Wii video game? How did this turn into uh, some sort of means of, of divination and uh, what what how did that happen that seems pretty extreme yeah and, and quite frankly I'm, I'm really glad that you made that distinction between cult and occult so mm. uh, occult because it's important for us to realize this because when we're talking about tarot cards just like this same we were with you know ouija boards or psychics and mediums and stuff like that th that's all occultic occult and just to kind of revisit that definition before we go any further, uh, when we're talking about the occult, we're talking about trying to gain some kind of hidden knowledge or power uh, through supernatural means outside the God of the Bible. And that's what is actually taking place uh, with the use of tarot cards. Now, we'll, we'll unpack that a little bit more uh, later. But um, so, how did this turn in from just this card, uh, this card game of, of Italian nobility uh, folks just kind of having fun, passing the time, to uh, this occultic activity, and that, that really makes the change in the 18th century. So, mm. in the 1700s, the late 1700s, uh, 1773, uh, you have uh, the use of these cards in France, and that's when you had this this multi-volume encyclopedia put out that uh, by a guy by the name of Antoine Court de Giblon. I'm sure I'm butchering his name, but that's okay. That's my, my Texan French, I guess. Uh, but in this work, what he does is he purported that these cards were tied to this, um, this uh, lit literary work called the Book of Thoth, which is... Uh, this this ancient uh, Egyptian book, it, and he said, no, 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 all these cards, they they have these spiritual meanings behind them, um, and now the interesting part is the whole tie to this Egyptian priesthood stuff. It, it all turned out to be spurious. It was fake, and uh, but you know the whole there's meaning behind these cards and all this. It kind of caught on. Uh, in fact, it, it was it was the work of a get this an algebra teacher turned publisher, Jean Baptiste Alouette, 
that uh, began publishing guides to the cards. And so once the guides to the cards were put together, now all of a sudden everybody had something to work on. Oh, well, this card means this. This card means that. So if we do this and we do that, now we can begin to determine and understand uh, the answers to our questions or, or we can understand what – you know what's coming in the future and so this this became a um it's really kind of caught caught hold and uh it, it caught the eye of a guy by the name of uh, eliphas levi uh, who was a french occultist and levi then connected the symbols of the tarot cards to kabbalah and uh, we, we won't stop and talk about Kabbalah now, but uh, that, that would be a whole episode in and of itself. But um, and so, again, you, you have this this movement into now we're, we're starting to mix other mystical occultic type activities and understandings with the cards. And so people are just kind of adding on one after the other. Now, uh, as we move from the 18th century to the 19th century, what you see here in America is you see a, a huge spike in the occult. Now, I know we talked about this with the Ouija board, but um, man, it was the occultic activities became mainstream. I mean, people were having uh, seances in their parlor. Uh, you had more people with Ouija boards than prayer books. Uh, I, this was just. I mean, it was an amazing time to see such a spike in the uh, popularity of the occult. And um, so that's really how it got, got its movement from you know Europe to America. But um, it, it really was in the 19th, or 19th century or into the 20th century that we see the um, – maybe I guess the, the solidification – of the popularity of tarot, and while I think you know tarot will uh, will continue on um, into popularity at least for you know who knows maybe another hundred years or so uh, through a guy by the name of Aleister Crowley. Now we have a profile on Aleister Crowley, and he is a interesting individual. In fact, um, it was really funny when we were talking about. Uh, one of the things that we do at Watchmen is uh, we don't want to just talk about people. We want to talk to people. And so as I was doing my research uh, on tarot cards and I wrote the profile, one of the things that was just essential, it had to be done before I could even you know, turn it in for it to be published, was I had to go find some tarot card readers to read my work. And uh, you had mentioned uh, some relationships that we have, have made with uh, some folks over the, at a metaphysical bookshop in Fort Worth. And, and I went over and talked to a couple of different tarot card readers. And one of the guys spent a lot of time with me. And, and we got to chat for a while. And, and when I said the name Aleister Crowley and we brought that up, and because we were talking about the, the deck of cards that he put out, the guy just kind of rolled his eyes and shook his head and, you know, almost kind of like, this guy's a train wreck. But uh, Alistair was part of this group called the uh, Order of the Golden Dawn. Or, excuse me, let me say it the right way. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And uh, this was just... Oh, let me, a, uh, let, me uh -huh. inter let me interject something. I, j I just learned... I, I, now, I, I don't know the depth... Or the length, but just as an aside, the the Order of the Golden Dawn. I have just heard about that uh, in my YouTube feed. I listen to a lot. Of, I, I watch a lot of uh, music videos and and you know histories of musicians. I used to listen to. I was watching briefly for a few seconds an interview with the guitarist of Led Zeppelin, Jimmy Page, who had said, and I don't know how extensive it was. It was very brief. So to be fair to Jimmy Page, I don't know how much he got involved with it, but he got involved with the Order of the Golden Dawn. So that's interesting that you mentioned that. Anyway, just an aside for people that might know something about Led Zeppelin. <laughs> to make well, that connection. Go. There you go. Yeah, you know, it, again, it's a secret society. And um, this is what's interesting is that Crowley was really influential, as, as flamboyant and um, kind of out there as, as he was. Um, in 2002, the BBC... Uh, did a a ranking they did this they did this broadcast of of the hundred you know greatest britons well he made number 73 on the list i mean that that just kind of gives you an idea of of how influential and popular 
uh, he was. Now, he was into what's called Thelma Magic, and that's magic with a K. Uh, he produced a set of tarot cards that were illustrated by a friend of his name, uh, Lady Frida Harris. Now, she was also a member of the Order of the Golden Dawn as well. And so he made um, his deck was a little bit different in that he made two changes uh, to the deck. Uh, one of which was he changed in, in the traditional deck you have one card that's called strength uh, and he changed that to lust uh, then uh, he had uh, he changed the temperance card uh, to say art and now what was what was interesting is that he put together what what was called the book of thoth now uh, I mean don't don't get it totally confused with what we talked about before but he originally published 200 copies of this but the the deck actually wasn't published until um 22 years after his death and so he mm. so they, those cards were published in 1969 he died in 1950 uh, uh 1947 excuse me so um again you just you see the involvement and in how the popularity kind of takes hold and, and of course now as we enter into the 21st century there's there's all kinds of cards um you know you you literally have hundreds of decks you have novelty decks um i was it was kind of funny as i was researching just the novelty decks i mean you had everything from cats to uh friends uh, the, the television show from the 90s, uh, they, they had a Friends deck, so you'd see, you know, Ross and Chandler and Monica. I can't remember all the characters' names. Channeling but, Chandler. Uh, yeah, so it was it was kind of funny. But, um, but you can kind of see really kind of how the popularity can, can continue as they, you know, do stuff like this. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember much about the reading that I had Um 30 years ago I, I don't recall it that much but there were cards involved and you know each card would come up and she would explain something um, you just mentioned that there's a multiplicity of decks with mm -hmm. different uh, varieties and pictures and themes um, is there a standardized way like if you're gonna go to a top dollar tarot card reader you, you want the you want the Apple computer the, the sort of the top of the line in tarot technology um, how do we how do we discern that somebody didn't just go to Walmart and get them some tarot cards I don't know you can can't get tarot cards I don't think you can get tarot cards at Walmart. you have to go to a specialty shop where they have incense and all that yes stuff. yeah you go um, go to a metaphysical books but book target store, won't, book target store, right? won't have it we're not encouraging you to go get your tarot cards no no saying no. that uh, don't look for them at Target or Walmart but anyway, the, it, it seems like somebody could just sit in their living room and say, hey, I got some tarot cards at the shop in Fort Worth. Come over, I'll give you a reading. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like there's, there, there might be a difference between you know, people that are just sort of playing with it for a couple mm -hmm. of dollars on the side, and then there's like the real stuff that opens doors to the demonic. Um, but what, yeah. how, what's, what's going on here? I mean, how do we know, like, the difference between the decks and, and you know, what's yeah. going on? Now, now that might even be an, another question of itself, and, and I, I imagine we'll get to it, but, um, you know, even how it works and all. But um, because I, I definitely think that there is a spiritual aspect uh, to this. But let, let's roll back to the uh, to the question here for a moment. Uh, again, there's there's literally hundreds of decks. Now, here's the interesting thing, and, and this is just kind of a aside from from your question, is that uh, many tarot card readers will say you can't just go out and go buy your own deck of cards. That you need to have a deck given to you for it to really have its power, and uh, which I I thought that was really interesting, and um, in fact that was one of the things I, I was really curious about as I talked to a couple different tarot card readers. And they all basically said, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's much better if, if the deck is given to you. But um, here's the thing. There is no standard. This is, uh, in fact, the whole practice, I'll probably say this again, but, but I, I, I think it would need repeating anyway, is that this whole activity of tarot card readings is super subjective. I mean, it is just... Sounds like uh, it. Yeah, I mean, it's to just say it's subjective is almost an understatement. Mm. Uh, but... Uh, anyway, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. But so as we look at these deck of cards, there's not a standard deck. There's not the um, 
you know, there's not one or the other. Uh, but the most popular deck by far is the Rider Weight deck. Now, um, what could be confusing if you if you were doing research on your own, you might would notice that uh, well, some say the Rider Weight Smith. Um, what, okay, well, what's the difference? Well, the Rider Weight deck, the colors are a little more vibrant. Um, as to where the Rider Weight uh, Smith deck, the colors are just a little more drab. Uh, they're they're just they're not as bright, and um, why that is why that's even worth noting is just because there's when you look at one of these cards there's meanings to every part of it and we'll, we'll break that down a, a little bit later but even the color of the cards in fact one of the tarot card readers that i talked to uh, he told me that he uses only a black and white deck in fact he showed me the deck that that he uses and uh, i said so you don't have any colors at all i said is this because you want to focus on the colors that are around that person uh, like you know the color shirt they're wearing or so, and he said absolutely. He says I don't want to be I don't want to be distracted by the colors on the car. I want to look at the person. And so, again, we're talking about assigning meaning to every facet of this. So the color of the card, the um, the depiction of how whatever image is on the card is given. All these things are said to have meaning. Now, where did this meaning come from? Essentially, it was just made up. I, I mean, that's. I mean, as you look through the history of this, that's exactly what you see. Is this is just simply, uh, you know, made up meanings to these cards, and and that's uh, kind of the the wild part of this. So, if I'm just making this up, mm -hmm. this seems a little bit. Um, it doesn't seem. Somebody might say to to push back a little bit. Well, it's just harmless. We're just having fun. So this is like playing cards. Right, it's about as bad as poker, you know. I mean, poker's you know, you give a little money, you you find out something about uh, it, it, it. But but tarot cards, given they're so subjective and there's no real standard, and everybody just seems to be making up meaning. What is? Bef but before I get into this question, let me back up just one second and, and ask you another technical question about the mm -hmm. cards. This seems to be something that we talked about in Burning Man, where there mm -hmm. are no rules, but that there are rules. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the bizarre sort of come and do whatever you want but obey these 10 rules and it seems like we're in this this seems to be a hallmark of occult practices that there is some kind of thing going on here there's some kind of standard but but at the same time i'm just sort of channeling and making things up as we go but there is something uh you'd mentioned in in the research um in the notes that you sent me something about arcanas minor major and minor arcanas in the card yeah yeah. Uh, is that something that's also been fabricated by the French, or did the Italian, did Filippo make it up, or where where did the Arcanas come from, and what are they, and how does this pertain to tarot? Yeah, yeah, it was funny as you were talking. All I could think of was uh, was it the Meatloaf song? I do anything for love, but I won't but do wouldn't, that. I won't do that. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of the same. We have another. Idea here. We have another theme going on in this podcast. We're talking about music. You mentioned Meatloaf. I mentioned Jimmy Page. We might as well throw Ozzy Osbourne in here because he has a song. <laughs> called Mr. Crowley or Mr. Uh -huh. Crowley uh, uh -huh. talking about that 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 the guy said for for reference in case people didn't know that that's the guy that Ozzy sings about uh, there you go but anyway um let's talk about this arcana yeah it, so it okay let's uh let, let's kind of break into the deck of cards here for just a moment uh, a deck of tarot cards will uh number in 78 and they're divided into two categories you have the major arcana and the minor arcana now, uh, the major arcana consists of 22 cards, and these think of these as like major life events. Okay, uh, these are things that that you're going to go through, whether it's um, you know romance. Uh, that's that's kind of like the most popular thing. Maybe you're thinking about joining a, re a new religion or something, uh, which almost kind of seems. Do uh, they have a um, pandemic card? Do they? <laughs> Did that was that in the cards for? Anybody? Um, I yeah, I don't know. I, I'm sure somebody claims that they did, but uh, <laughs> th there's no there's no pandemic card, so to speak. But the there is a death issue, card, right? There's a, a card of death. There, there is a death card, um, and that is well. Let me just say this: people wanting to know about their health is a very, very popular 
uh, reason yeah. why people go to tarot cards. Really, the, right. the two biggies are, well, I guess you could probably say the three biggies is uh, relationships, uh, money, and health. And um, so th- these are what people want answers on, and so therefore that's mm. you know that's Makes what sense. they go after. Yeah. Now, um, so yeah, so your major arcana cards are they're, they're dealing with the you know the big milestones in life as to where the minor arcana cards are kind of like the minor or the mundane, the normal just bleh of life that that goes on, and so uh, that you know would constitute the other fifty six cards. Uh, of, of the deck now the the major arcana they are numbered zero to 21 and so these are looking at, at, at you know these big events in a person's life um, you have the fool in fact it, it starts with the fool and that's not saying well ultimately what they would say is you are the fool but not that you're a fool that you just you know you don't know and then you're traveling and you're journeying all the way uh, to death. Uh, so uh, this is this is, the fool's like your earliest awareness, uh, all the way through the inter- integration of these other cards. And then the death is fulfillment. Uh, it is uh, the culmination of your life. It's it's the ending, if you will. And so, uh, you know, if you if you were to draw a death card, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to die. Uh, um, in any particular time, they would say, no, this is the fulfillment of, this is the end of this event, maybe. Uh, something of that nature. Again, it's very subjective. So, I mean, you know, you're, it's almost like the meanings could, could vary from, from person to person. But, but that's more or less the general idea or concept of it. It strikes me as having a lot of similarities with astrology. I mean, oh yeah, uh-huh. you know the uh, recently the the moon at night, uh, the crescent moon, it appeared in the constellation of Leo, and so that has significance if you're Leo the lion. What did that? What what's that significance? It depends on the astrologer you're talking to. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're born under the sign of Leo, this this and this. But if you read any newspaper with, that still do horoscopes, I don't know if they do, but but the horoscopes and the whole astrology thing is so. So ambiguous, so subjective, so vague. It, you, you could mean anything, you know. Yeah. And and so what it seems to me, Brady, it seems this this has, I, I see a, a similarity in tarot cards that I've seen here at Watchmen when we talk about occult occult practices and the occult. It seems like people are hungry and seeking things for themselves. They want to know. Yeah. You know, it's all about me. I want to know about me. I, I want to be able to know that I'm going to be okay. I want this for myself. I want this for myself. I want this for myself. It's a, an illegitimate way of trying to, to acquire things for yourself, to know the future, yeah. um, to be like God, right? It, yeah. it has this, I, this, this th- what's going to happen to me? I'm going to consult the stars. I'm going to consult mediums or spiritualists or a divinate, you know, divination, which mm-hmm. is the Bible. The Bible explicitly forbids this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And, and one thing I saw in pre- preparing for our talk through scripture the theme in the Old Testament, anyway, for all the verses that you see about divination, is that uh, divination is a lie. It's just lying to you. It's, there's no truth coming out of divination. It's it's all lies and um, and this kind of thing. So why don't we finish up part two here, part one here, and then we'll go into part two in a little bit more detail. But let's talk a little bit about those biblical prohibitions yeah. against divination. Yeah. Before we do, I want to finish off because we talked about the major arcana, but we, we hadn't talked about the minor arcana. And, okay. And so yeah. we, we've covered 22 of the cards of a 78-card deck. The um, Because there's a lot of folks who who are um, really kind of concerned about, like, you know, should I use playing cards or not? And, and I kind of see that maybe more as a, a Christian liberty issue. If you don't feel comfortable with it, then that's fine. Um, playing cards are... are a, really innocuous um but the big difference is is in these minor arcana cards you know we we think about like a a deck of cards we'd have you know a king queen jack ace uh you know like the face cards if you will and then we have you know two through ten well the tarot cards are a little bit different in that uh there's some similarities like you still have face cards but they have a king, queen, knight, and page. 
and then you have the number cards and uh, th these number cards are really purported to, to work with these day-to-day -day life you know how does how does this work how does that work and they are numbered from one to ten and so you know you have uh, you have four different uh, suits if you will you know in a standard deck of playing cards you know you have what hearts diamonds clubs spades well in the tarot cards uh, you would have uh, you'd have uh, wands swords cups or pentacles circles and so there's uh, there's a difference there but again everything is tied to a meaning and this is kind of the frustrating part as you study this stuff because the meaning is subjective based on whoever's reading the cards and so therefore it becomes really kind of difficult to you know. um to to discuss that um but um so that that's basically that's basically the gist of it. Uh, in the profile, I'll go into a, a lot more detail, and uh, yep. it's 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 worth it's worth the read just to try to understand. If you get the opportunity to be able to share your faith uh, with somebody, uh, to be able to take the time to um, really get a hold of of what this is all about, so that you can have an intelligible conversation. and And I think it was a great example of whenever I was talking to uh, the tarot card readers who who read my work, we were, you know, because I took the time to get to know them, uh, they, I mean, they were super nice. And we had, I mean, we had a really long conversation that I don't know if I would have had if, if I couldn't have gained and garnered their respect by, by knowing something about them. Mm. Um, now, you mentioned the Old Testament. Uh, one of the things that, that I did, I, I wanted to look at the biblical response um a little bit differently because I've written on the occult quite a bit. James Van Preg, the Long Island Medium, uh, the Ouija board, uh, Wicca and witchcraft. And so uh, I wanted to just kind of dig a little bit deeper into the Bible. And what was interesting is that, and you've already mentioned it, I mean, the Bible is crystal clear for us not to be involved in divination. And I know that we haven't talked a whole lot about divination in part one, but part two, we're gonna, that's going to be the main focus, uh, I know. Um, but the Bible warns us against this. And as you look through this, you're not going to find one single passage in the Old Testament that says, um, and they went to a divinator and uh, God blessed them. Uh, in fact, what you see is, in fact, I give one example of, of Israel going into, um, they're going into war. They fall. Uh, why? Because they had sought out, you know, divinators. They had sought out uh, occultic activities. And then what happens? Well, you have Judah following suit. And they fall right into the hands of the Assyrians. Why? Because rather than going to God, they want to shortcut God and and get the answer that they need. And and that's really what the foundation of, of tarot card reading is, is uh, especially for the believers who want to be involved in it and say, oh, well, it's no big deal. Well, here, here's the problem. Listen, wait on God. You say, well, God's not giving me my answer. Okay, Saul, that's okay. Wait for him, you know. Uh, you know, we're thinking about Saul going to the, you know, to the medium at, at Endor. You know, what was his problem? He couldn't get an answer from God, so what did he try to do? He tried to shortcut God. Well, right. listen, anytime we try to shortcut God, in any, anytime we try to shortcut any area of our life, uh, we're going to find ourselves in, um, in just a, a huge mess. And, right. and that's what we see, I think, all throughout the Old Testament. It just gives us warning after warning after warning after warning. How many times have we got to be told? Yeah, Jeremiah talks about this. Don't listen to the divinators that uh, say that uh, you will not serve the king of Babylon. Right? Isaiah says, you know, it is God who created the heavens and the earth. He puts to shame the divinators. Um, yes. That, that, that this is something that he warns them about in Deuteronomy. Um, mm -hmm. That... that uh, that when you go into the land to possess, don't take up the practices of these people. One of the practices yeah. of the Canaanites was divination. Well, they didn't get rid of the Canaanites, and so what do we expect? You know, generations later, they're practicing divination because they didn't completely eliminate 
the uh, practices and the people uh, that were in the land. And so they took up these practices. And I think the temptation is still there for us today as Christians in a culture that is continually turning away from God and continually looking to its, itself, its own technologies, its own wisdom, man for solutions to things. And um, in a sense um, that, that, that I think, you know, Brady, in one sense, I know that I don't mean to say secular scientists are divinators. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that. But I, I do notice a similarity in that when a secular scientist talks about how he interprets nature, skulls mm -hmm. or rocks or fossils or stars, yeah. and he does so in a way that he thinks that does away with God, mm -hmm. I don't think it's any better than divination. That, that yeah. it's the same kind of spiritual danger, that, that I'm going to use my knowledge yep. basically to replace God's knowledge. Exactly. And that that I, that just seems to be the underlying danger. I'm going to get ahead of God. I want to know what God knows. I want to know my future. This is Priscilla. So let's go all the way back to the garden, right? What was the yeah. temptation? But to know good and evil, and to be to be like God and knowing good and evil. Well, so, and we all we all have a God at some point. I yeah. mean, everybody, even an atheist, has a God at some point. It might be themselves, mm -hmm. but we all have something that we're willing um, to bow the knee to. And yeah. uh, even even and I think oftentimes is maybe our own selfish desires. But I mean, you think about this. I, I guess one of my favorite one of my favorite aspects of this is like if you're wondering how bad it is to do a practice like tarot cards or anything occultic, uh, I just look no further than than First Samuel fifteen twenty three when the um, you know this this occultic activity is used as an example of how bad things are you know they'll say rebellion is is as the sin of witchcraft i mean like that's how you know that you're really in a bad place when what you're doing is the example of how bad other sins are <laughs> like you right. know they're right. trying to draw it in so well i think um, we can uh, we can conclude brady uh, part one here I that, think so. that uh, tarot card divination is a house of cards. <laughs> yeah, it is a house of cards, and we're going to knock it over in the next section. <laughs> There's no foundation to it. Uh, so thanks for, for this, for part one. And in part two, we're going to talk about uh, what do individual cards mean. We'll get into more details about this mm -hmm. um, so that you can be informed and knowledgeable with anybody that you might meet who thinks, uh, you know, tarot cards. I went to my tarot card friend last night. It's no big deal. You can really get into the conversation and really help people understand the dangers of this and what you're, what you're doing. Um, so we will talk more in detail about tarot cards in part two. Thank you so much, Brady. Uh, Brady Blevins, Senior Apologist, Watchman Fellowship, talking about tarot cards. The profile will be coming out when, Brady? It should be at the end of, of June. Excellent, excellent. That's a four-page profile, very well researched. Brady has actually talked to people who... Who, uh, who are versed in tarot card practice. And so uh, that's what we do at Watchmen. We try to interview people and talk to people and get to know their perspective, steel manning their position so that we can better understand it and present it to you in a way that's helpful and informative. So uh, hope to see you next Monday right here on Apologetics Profile for part two of our talk about tarot cards. Today more than ever, it is critical to know the truth about the gospel to resist the devil and glorify God. Apologetics Profile is a podcast ministry of Watchman Fellowship designed to equip you through easy to follow conversational style interviews about a wide range of topics and ideas that impact your faith. Become a Patreon sponsor of Apologetics Profile today for as little as $1 a month. Visit patreon.com slash apologetics profile today. For Watchman Fellowship, I'm Dave Mitchell.